This week we're picking up in a series that we're doing on 1 John. And for anybody who's been here the last couple of weeks, you'll have to think way back to three weeks ago because we took two weeks off while we had Rick Love here speaking about peacemaking issues. And so if you can jar your memory way back to three weeks ago, we were talking about 1 John and the the second message in the series, which was three weeks ago, was on getting real about sin. And this is actually going to be part two of that message that happened uh, way back. I want to give us just a, a little reminder of what we talked about since it was a while ago. This is 1 John 1, 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Uh, and so we talked three weeks ago about how important it is for us as followers of Jesus to be real about the fact that we screw things up all the time. We're going to be real about the fact that, that we still sin. And by sin, we mean we do things that are wrong. We do things that are selfish. We do things that are inappropriate. We do things that are displeasing to God and harmful to other people. And we'd like to think that as followers of Jesus, we don't do those kinds of things. And what we learned in the first chapter of John is that we do. Uh, we all do. And that if we pretend that we don't, it doesn't actually help us out. It just means that we're lying, which is yet another sin. And so there's this encouragement just to admit that you know, we're screwing things up kind of all the time. Uh, and just to be able to be real about that. And we talked about how we want this community to be a safe place, to be honest uh, about our failings and our weaknesses. Um, now... This week, we're going to take a look at the next chapter, which is going to swing in the other direction, pushing us toward holiness, pushing us toward having our whole lives committed to Jesus and the expectation that followers of Jesus actually do live lives of obedience to Jesus. And so we're going to talk about living in the tension of those two things. I think that's really hard for us. I find that human beings in general have a really hard time living in tension we have a really hard time with balance. We have a really hard time with both and. Uh, and we tend to be all or nothing people. We like to swing in one direction. Either everything is okay, you know, God forgives me, it's all fine, I can do whatever I want because God forgives me, or it's, you know, obsessive, look, look at that person, see what they're doing, they're really bad. Uh, and then that comes down on us too. Oh, I'm such a terrible person. And we heap judgment on ourselves. And, and we have a hard time finding balance. We have a hard time finding God's path in the middle of that. Just a, a relatively silly example. Uh, when I was 16 years old, like a lot of 16-year-old girls, I started to get really worried about my weight. I was worried that I was too fat, and I spent a lot of time looking in the mirror, freaking out about whether or not I weighed too much. And so I eventually went on this kind of, this kind of extreme diet. Uh, you could only eat a really limited number of things, and it was all kind of very carefully planned. And it was kind of tiny little portions and you know, just like two tablespoons of fat per day. And everything was just kind of very, very carefully regimented. And I stuck to that thing for like two whole weeks. I... I just was bound and determined that I was going to do this. And then after about two weeks, I get in a terrible argument over a silly thing with my mom. And I was really upset and really angry. And I really wanted to hurt my mom. And so I went to the donut store. And I bought a dozen donuts. And I went home and I ate nine of those dozen donuts. You might not think that a 16-year-old girl can eat nine donuts. But trust me, I ate nine donuts. Not quite in one sitting, but within about like four hours, I, I ate all nine of those donuts. And that was the end of the, the extremely regimented diet, you know, which may or may not have been a good thing because it was probably a rather misguided diet in, in the first place. But, but isn't it sort of like us to either try to control every little tiny thing or just to go hog wild and throw it all away? Um, and how do we as Christians you know, find balance? How do we find a healthy approach? And we've, we've got a call to holiness from God, and then at the same time, we've got the knowledge that we fail and the peace that comes from knowing God's forgiveness. And how do we, how do we live in the midst of that tension? And that's what we're going to talk about as we take a look at the second chapter of 1 John. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to read on from here. 
Holy Spirit, just acknowledge that we, that we need you. Uh, that left to our own devices, we, we tend to screw a lot of things up. And God, I just ask that you would teach us from your word today, that you would help us to find healthy balance in our lives, help us to, to live in a way that's pleasing to you, in a way that's honest. And would you teach us that from your word? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So picking up in the second chapter of 1 John, John says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we've come to him, we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Those who say, I know him, but do not do his commands are liars, and the truth is not in them. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we're in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus. And so I think this really outlines the tension that we're talking about right here. In, in the first chapter, we learned we all sin, and we have to be able to be honest about that. And now we hear, hey, I'm writing this to you so that you won't sin. And then we hear, but if you do sin, it's okay, because you're forgiven. God has grace for us, and through Jesus, we're forgiven on the cross. And so if anybody does sin, it's all right. And then we hear, actually, if you're sinning, it's not all right. Uh, for those of us who are actually claiming to be in Jesus... If we're saying we're in Jesus and then we're sinning, we're not obeying God, we're not doing the things that he says, then we are once again liars and we're, and we're missing it. Um, and so again, the, the tension. If we claim to know Jesus, we should be living in obedience to him. And yet at the same time, if we claim to know Jesus, we know that we're not living in perfect obedience to him. We're also living in failure. And so we're people who live in success and failure all the time, in obedience and disobedience uh, all of the time. Um, we, we won't find ourselves entirely free from sin until Jesus returns. And an important thing for us to think about is John doesn't juxtapose these two things by accident. It's not like he doesn't know that he seems to be contradicting himself. He's wanting us to wrestle through the tension of this. Uh, so he's doing this deliberately. One thing that we talk about a lot in the vineyard is the concept of already and not yet. The concept that in some ways we are already set free. Sin no longer has control over our lives. We're free to do what's good from now on. And yet at the same time, we're, we're not living in the fullness of that freedom. Even though we've been set free, we're still living out darkness in our lives. We're still living out sin in our lives. And so we're going to talk about embracing the tension of already and not yet. And I'm going to make just two points about that first, actually three. Um, and the first one is that in order to live in the tension of the already and not yet, we need to live in humility, knowing the peace of forgiveness. And that's what we talked about three weeks ago. We, we humble ourselves, we admit we're not getting this right. We're getting this wrong a lot of the time. And then we find peace in the fact that we know we're forgiven. Jesus forgives us and we can trust in that and it's going to be okay. Um, the flip side of that is that we need to live in faithfulness, committing to the practice of obedience. Because we know that God forgives us, we don't go out and just do whatever we want. We don't go crazy, not listening to Jesus' teaching. But we, at the same time as we acknowledge that we are sinners, we commit with our whole hearts to living in faithfulness. We commit with everything that we have that our whole lives will be lived in obedience to Jesus. Uh, now, the big question that comes to my mind when I think about this is how? How does one live out both of those things at the same time? Um, 
And we're not going to go there in depth today, but one place that I love is Romans. Paul addresses this whole concept very thoroughly in Romans. He walks through the, the whole thing, explains how we all fail, explains how we need to not judge one another for other people's failings, and that we are forgiven. And yet, at the same time, that being forgiven doesn't mean that we're not called to holiness and really emphasizes that we need to live out holiness. And what he tells us in terms of how to go about doing that is that we can't really do that by trying hard to follow the rules. Trying really hard to follow the rules always ends up leading to failure, sort of like my donut binge. When we're focused on following the rules, we often just end up discouraged, frustrated, and in trouble. And what, what Paul tells us in Romans instead to do, which I think is incredibly wise, is to focus on the freedom to do good by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we don't sit around thinking about all the things that we're not going to do. We sit around thinking about all of the good things that we are free to do. Think, trying to think about all of the bad things that we're not going to do is sort of like, you've heard people say, you know, don't think of a pink elephant. You know, it doesn't really work. Thinking about what we're not going to do tends to just make us absolutely crazy. Going back with the kind of eating healthy thing, you know, if, if I want to lose weight or say I just want to eat more healthy and I eat one cookie and I'm not going to eat a second cookie. My plan is eat one cookie but not two cookies. And then I eat my one cookie and then afterwards I sit around thinking, okay, don't eat another cookie. Michelle, don't eat another cookie. Don't eat another cookie. Okay, Michelle, what are you doing? I'm not eating a cookie. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, what am I going to want to do? Like, that's all I'm going to want to do, right? If I'm just thinking, they're thinking, I don't eat a cookie, don't eat a cookie, you know? And then it gets worse because then I see somebody else eating a cookie, right? Like, look, they're eating a cookie. Look at that bad person. I had one cookie, they had two cookies, they're bad. Um, or actually, the, the worst thing that tends to happen is, like, how come they got to have two? Well, I'm only allowed to have one but they're allowed to have two. That's not fair. I should be allowed to have another cookie. And then that leads me into, into all kinds of problems, right? Now, for me, it's actually not cookies or donuts that usually kicks my butt. Um, what, what did kick my butt a lot when I was younger was alcohol. So for me, the big struggle was with alcohol. And um, I found when I was trying to quit drinking that going to parties, watching other people drink, and thinking, okay, you know, don't have another beer. Don't have a beer. Don't drink. Okay, Michelle, what are you doing? I am not drinking. I'm watching other people drink. I'm not having any fun, and I'm not drinking. I'm totally focused on not drinking alcohol, and that didn't really lead to success. That usually led to me going out and getting drunk. And what also didn't work was me watching other people drinking and then starting to think, man, you know, it's not fair. Like, how come those people get to drink? You know, how come all of these people in this room get to drink and I don't? It's not fair. I should be allowed to drink. And there was a point in my life when I actually convinced myself that since normal people could drink, that I should be able to drink like a normal person. So I decided I was going to go out. Everybody else is allowed to drink. That means I'm allowed to drink too. So I decided to go out and drink like a normal person. And um, that night I blacked out, and I have no idea what I did that night. And I woke up in the morning realizing that it really is true that they get to drink, and I don't. The, the reality of life is that sometimes other people get to drink and you don't. And that's just, that's what it looks like to try to live out life as individual people. Um, and what I had to do in the end was stop thinking about not drinking and start thinking about all the other things that I did have the freedom to do. I had to start discovering new things that I liked. I realized I'd spent so much of my time getting high that I didn't really know what else was fun. And so I had to start telling myself, hey, what are some fun things that I am free to do? And I started spending a lot more time outdoors. Uh, I started doing a lot of hiking and a lot of body surfing. I spent a lot of time in the ocean. I spent a lot of time in the mountains and in the desert. And I just rediscovered what else is fun. And that brought success, thinking about what I am free 
to eat. Do, doing the, the food thing again, if I was trying to eat more healthy, instead of thinking about the cookie I'm not going to eat. It's so much easier for me to be intentional about eating healthy when I instead think about all of the really good stuff that's healthy for my body that I'm going to eat. So when I'm being successful at trying to eat healthy, I'm thinking, ah, you know, I'm making myself a big salad. I'm going to put good, healthy stuff on my salad. What's good, healthy, and yummy? And I'm thinking about all of the good stuff that I'm going to eat, that all the things I'm going to feed my body that are going to be healthy and good for me. And all of a sudden, I have a great attitude about it. Um, and so we focus on the freedom to do good as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, not in our own strength, but in God's strength as he enables us to do that. Um, now, what does that actually look like when we live it out? Uh, according to John, it looks like us walking around like Jesus, doing the things that Jesus did. There's a, there's a, a Greek word in here where it says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Uh, to live as Jesus did, the actual word in here is one that I really like. It's peripateo. And what it means is to walk around. And the reason why I like it is because I like the fact that some idioms don't change. You know, sometimes you read things in other languages and you're, they're just, the idioms don't really make any sense. Like, why does that mean that? Those words don't go with that concept in my mind at all. Culturally, that doesn't make sense to me. But, uh, but in this case, the, the idiom is the same. Uh, it, it, basically, if you want to, if you're in Jesus, you should be walking around like Jesus. Um, we often say this person is like, this person is walking around uh, saying this or that. This person is walking around giving away, you know, we talk about walking around as the way that things that somebody does habitually, what, how people live their lives, and the idiom is the same. What it says here is if we want to be like Jesus, we should be walking around like Jesus. We should be walking around doing the things that Jesus is doing. It should be our general habit in our life to walk around acting like Jesus. Um, my original plan on this message had been to expand on this in a little bit more of a general sense, but I thought it would be appropriate in light of the Supreme Court ruling last week and a lot of the just questions about LGBT issues, et cetera, that have been just swirling around in the minds of people at Coast, that we talk about this particularly as it applies to addressing LGBT issues in the Christian community. And so we're going to do that now. So a few principles for walking around like Jesus in general and specifically as it applies to relating to the LGBT community. Uh, the first one here is don't get entangled with the government. Now, this one is important, and I want to explain what I don't mean by that. What I don't mean is don't vote. What I don't mean is don't share your political opinion. What I don't mean is not even, I don't mean don't run for office. I don't mean try to, no, try to influence the government. Uh, but it's really important that we don't get faith entangled with law, that we know the difference between who we are as Christians and the law that surrounds us, and we don't get those things all mixed up with each other. We need to remember that the kingdom that we're a part of is not a kingdom of this world. People wanted Jesus to seek political power. They wanted to put Jesus in a leadership role in the government. You're going to take over, right? And Jesus said, no, I'm actually not here to take over the government. The government's not my primary concern. Human beings are my primary concern, and the kingdom that I'm here representing is not a kingdom of this world. It's a kingdom of another world. Um, Jesus spent about zero time while he was here on this earth trying to change the government. Think about it. Zero time and effort trying to change the government. And zero time and effort trying to change people's lives through the law. Jesus wasn't there arguing what the laws should be. He was just interacting with people. Uh, and I think there's a good reason for this. And one of the good reasons for this is that it's not really very helpful to try to make other people act like Christians through laws. It doesn't work very well. 
passing laws to try to make people who are not Christians, who don't believe in God and don't endorse the lifestyle that we endorse, passing laws to try to make that happen, it just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense to ask people who are not Christians to live like Christians. And so Jesus didn't spend his time worrying about that. Instead, Jesus spent a lot of time worrying about how we could obey God over and against the law. Uh, some examples of that would be his interaction with the Sabbath day. When Jesus healed people on the Sabbath, the, the Jewish leaders came up to him and said, hey, you're not allowed to heal people. It's the Sabbath. Don't you know that you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath day? And his response was, you guys, what are you talking about? I'm here to do good things. And what better day to do good things than the day that's set aside to worship God? The rules that you guys have constructed around this don't make sense. You guys have constructed rules for how to follow God that aren't God's rules, and I'm not going to follow them. Another example would be divorce. Divorce was very common in the Roman world. Um, a number of Roman rulers were divorced and remarried several times. Lots of people were divorced and remarried times. Rome actually had no fault divorce. It was a really easy thing. It happened really regularly. And the Jewish community had a lot of questions about divorce. Hey, when is it a good idea to get divorced and when is it not a good idea to get divorced? What are the rules that surround divorce? And Jesus' response was kind of the same thing. Like, you look, you guys... Don't, don't ask me about what the rules are regarding when you can get divorced and when you can't div get divorced. Divorce is bad news. And that's not saying absolutely under any circumstances there is no excuse for getting divorced. But Jesus' point was, hey, this, don't look for excuses. Don't look for when you're justified. This is, it's, it's unhealthy, it's destructive, it's harmful. Look for ways to heal your marriage, not for an excuse to, to get divorced. And this goes on and on. Jesus tends to dodge the arguments about the law and focus on the people. Um, and so a lot of people are asking, just what does this mean for the church? If now same-sex marriage is legal around the country, so what, is, what does that mean for the church and what we do? Uh, our church is going to be under pressure to endorse gay marriage, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the answer is that we, we really don't need to worry about that. Yeah. In America, we've gotten a little bit spoiled because Christianity has been a favored religion since the beginning of our country. And we've kind of gotten used to the fact that a lot of the laws are on our side. But it was never that way from the beginning. Remember, it was illegal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire when things first began. Um, it's not always going to be legal to... The, the laws are not always going to comply exactly with our expectations as Christians, and that's okay. We don't need to be afraid of that. We don't need to be afraid of the end results of that. We live out the life that Jesus has called us to, regardless of what the laws are. Um, and an important piece of law that we do have is separation of, of church and state. And Actually, a lot of countries where same-sex marriage has been legal for a long time, uh, this is what people are doing, is they're separating legal marriage from religious marriage. Like, okay, that's fine. You know what? From now on, the church isn't going to perform legal marriage. You can get legally married at a courthouse, but we could celebrate religious marriage together as a community, but it's going to be, it's going to be different. Um, and that might sound a little bit scary, but just to put it in perspective... When this country was first started, the Puritans actually believed that's how it should be. Uh, the Puritans put a huge value on separation of church and state because they had seen the abuses that can happen. Remember, remember that in England, the king had made himself supreme head of the church. I, since I am king, I'm now in charge of the church, and I'm going to start telling the church what to do. And the reason why we have separation of church and state is exactly that, is to protect the church from the state. It's not just to protect the state from the church, but to protect the church from the state. Um, and, the, and the Puritans actually, in the beginning, for instance, in Massachusetts, when it was first started, only the state could perform a wedding. 
and the, the churches didn't do it because they felt like that was part of what the state should do, and they didn't want to get the two things entangled. So just keeping things in perspective, this wouldn't be the first time in the world where you know, legal marriage and religious marriage are thought of differently. Um, so don't get entangled with the government. Uh, the second thing here is welcome sinners and confront hypocrisy. Um, one thing to know uh, about vineyard churches is that in the vineyard, we do actually believe that marriage is designed by God to be between one man and one woman. Uh, and we do actually believe that sex outside of marriage is a sin. Uh, and that's an important thing to know. And I realize that not everyone at Coast Vineyard actually agrees with this, that in our community, we, we come from a lot of different viewpoints. Not everyone in this room uh, believes that or endorses that or feels comfortable with that. And I want to say for a minute that that's okay. It's okay that we don't all always agree on everything. And one thing that I love about this community is this is a place where we can talk. This is a place where we can dialogue. This is a place where we can listen to each other. This is a place where we can be aware of the possibility that we could be wrong. And that's really important. I want us to always be a community that's aware of the possibility that we could be wrong. On the flip side, as a, as a part of the vineyard, even if, even if we didn't actually endorse that, we wouldn't really have a choice. This is, it, it is the, it's the belief of our, of our movement, and it's something that, that we want to be committed to supporting here at, at Coast Vineyard. Um, so, so I believe, we believe, um, as a movement, that this is God's design for marriage, and this is God's design for our sexuality. Uh, a question related to that is, how does that make gay and lesbian people at Coast different from anyone else? And the answer to that question is, it absolutely doesn't in any way whatsoever. That if we thought a gay, lesbian, transgender, etc. person was somehow or other different from anyone else in this community, that would mean that we were utter and complete hypo uh, hypocrites and according to John, makes us liars. People, people who don't know what it means to live in faith. Because the scriptures tell us that every single one of us falls short. Every single one of us has sin in our lives. And if we look at another person and we judge another person's sin differently, then we judge our own sin. We're in the wrong. And so there, there's no aspect of fellowship at Coast Vineyard that will ever be closed uh, to a gay or lesbian person. We are, we are open, we are inviting people into fellowship, into our community to be part of us because we all stand on the same footing before God and we're welcoming all people into our community and we're unwilling to, to become hypocrites in that. Uh, Jesus welcomed us with open arms. Jesus welcomed sinners every day with open arms. He welcomed you, he welcomed me with open arms in spite of all of our failings. And it's our, our passionate desire as a church community that we would welcome people regardless of what their personal issues might happen to be with open arms. Um, and I don't think that we're talking here about tolerance. I don't really like the word tolerance. I don't think that tolerance is enough of, tolerance has always struck me as kind of a weak word. It means I agree to put up with you. And Jesus doesn't call us to put up with people. Jesus calls us to, to love people. Uh, there's a, a wonderful story that we've read uh, over and over again, most of us who are believers, uh, about a woman who is caught in adultery. And the, a, a crowd of, of religious leaders brings her, in, brings her in in front of the crowd and says, this woman was caught committing adultery. Interesting, the hypocrisy involved in the fact that there's no man that's being dragged in. So who knows, whatever, for whatever reason, only one person is being held accountable for their sins. This woman is, is drawn in front of the crowd and accused publicly. And it's, Jesus, what should we do? Should we stone her? Because the law says that we should kill her by throwing stones at her until she's dead. And Jesus' response is, you know, okay, let whoever is without sin throw the first stone. 
You know, if you don't have any sin in your life, then you throw the stone. And no one throws a stone. Um, they all walk away, one at a time. I think it's interesting that the oldest ones left first. It's like the more wisdom people had, the more they recognized that, that they needed to walk away, that, that this is wrong. Um, and and I, one thing I want to note about this is this is not tolerance. Jesus didn't hear display tolerance. Jesus wasn't saying, okay, well, I'm not going to kill you, you know. But he stood between her. He stood between her and the people who came against her and said, this is not okay. He called out the hypocrisy of the crowd, and he held them accountable for their hypocrisy, and he waited there until they left. And this is what I hope that we at Coast Vineyard can be, um, I would like for us to be like this to the gay community. Um, it's not okay just to say, hey, yeah, we'll put up with you here. But we have to be people who say, you know what, it's not okay with me if you're excluded. It's not okay with me if you're mistreated. One thing I never ever want to see in this community is gay jokes. It's not okay with me if you're mocked. It's not okay with me if somebody else thinks that you're a joke. We have to be more than tolerant. We need to be defenders. We need to be defenders of LGBT folks in our community and around us, and we need to, to have this place be a welcoming place and a safe place to come, to be welcomed, uh, and not to be judged. Now, I want to make a second point about this that also follows from this story, because it doesn't end here. So everybody leaves, and Jesus says, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one. So he's waited for this moment until they're alone. He doesn't say this in front of the crowd. He waits for them all to look at themselves, understand their own sin, and walk away. And then when they're all gone, he says, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Uh, so he's defended her from the crowd, but he's also given her instructions. Go now and change your life. Go now and live differently than you have in the past. And so the, the third thing on here on our few principles for walking like Jesus is call followers to, to aim for the mark. We still continue to hold the bar for following Jesus high, but we don't do it in a way that's judging. We do it in a way that's that's sensitive and caring and, and teaching. Uh, we talk a lot in the church about how uh, sin means to miss the mark, and that's why I'm using this language here. Call followers to, to aim for the mark. Our goal as Christians is that we would shoot straight. We're shooting for the mark uh, as much as we can. Uh, we're aiming for the target. Now, in a... In a practical way, I would say one thing that this means is we're, we're not going to start doing same-sex marriages at Coast. Um, we're going to welcome everybody to come to our community, whether they agree with us or not. But you know, Jamie and I are not going to start performing same-sex weddings uh, because we don't feel like that would be aiming for the target that God has given to us. Uh, another practical place where this plays out is in leadership. Uh, I want to give an example of this. Uh, we'll do a metaphor. Uh, let's pretend for a minute that at Coast our goal was to learn how to do archery. So we are going to, as a as a whole church, our plan is to become good archers, and we're going to we're going to learn and we're going to teach archery as a community. I picked this partly because uh, we have a, a leadership retreat. We take our kind of our core leadership team away on a retreat each year, and last year the, the place where we went has an, an archery range. And so a bunch of us were, were actually trying to learn how to do archery. And one thing that we discovered is that Jason, Tom, and I are the absolute worst archers on, like, the whole leadership team. So, you know, other people are shooting for the target, and they're all excited based on how close they are, you know, to the center of the bullseye. And Jason and I are shooting, and we're just like, hey, look, that one hit the haystack. You know, I hit, I hit the thing that the target is posted on. That's pretty good. You know, it didn't just go over it or around it. Um, you know, so we were excited just if we hit anything at all. And also, you know, some of my arrows actually hit the target sideways. 
Like, I, I don't know how to explain that. I'm not really sure what the physics are involved in shooting an arrow and getting it to like flip around and it hit at a full, like, you know, complete opposite angle of what the intended plan is supposed to be. Some of ours didn't hit, like, some of us, ours didn't make it to the target. Um, you know, somebody else who was actually really good at this was Joe Pace. Joe Pace is really good at archery. So if you ever want to know kind of like secret skills, he's really good at this. So we're watching and we're just totally in awe and jealous. And Jason and I are trying to go at the same time so that it won't be like, it'll just look like, you know, some people are good and some people are not. And nobody would look at us and go, who did that? <laughs> um, so, but, but if we were to choose leadership, if we were to bring somebody on as an instructor on how to do archery, would you want me or Joe Pace? Who would you pick? Right? You wouldn't pick me for, for, for leadership in this project, right? You wouldn't pick me as an instructor to other people to help people learn how to do archery because you would assume that I wouldn't be really the best person to, to learn from. Um, taking this metaphor a little bit further, um, let's say we, we appoint Joe to be the, the instructor for archery at Coast. Uh, is it a requirement that every single arrow that he shoots hits the bullseye? No. It's not a requirement that every arrow he shoots hits the bullseye. He can, he can miss. It's not immediately, oh my goodness, you know, you missed the, like, what was that? You missed, you're out. It's not even like three times and you're out, right? There could be some cases where you could be out. You know, if he turned around and shot his arrow kind of like, you know, into the crowd of people or something like that, that would be, okay, you're out, you're done. Um, we're not giving you another chance for a long time. We want to be convinced that you've really changed before we're going to let you even come to practice for a little while. Um, right? But for the most part, no, you don't have to hit the bullseye every single time. Um, but we're hoping that people who are, who are in leadership at Coast are people who are, are, are aiming for the target and they're experiencing you know, enough of a level of success at hitting it that they could help somebody else along. Um, and a couple other little things. You, you probably have to be in basic agreement on where the target is. Um, you know, it can't be sort of, I, I'm hitting the target by my own definition because I was shooting for something else. Um, and you have to have a heart to teach and encourage other people, right? You have to be, you have to be willing to, to invest in caring for people and raising them up and teaching them. That's got to be something that you like doing. Um, and so when we talk about leadership at Coast, we're looking for people who are modeling discipleship well as we understand it to be in the vineyard. Um, we can't expect for people to be perfect. Um, and instead, we have to be able to be honest about our sin. Um, so what we expect is simply that people will be experiencing some amount of success and focused in on, on the target and be team players. So that's a couple of just practical ways to think about this uh, at Coast. Now, I want to remind us that we, we focused a little bit on you know, what does this look like in terms of how to think about the recent Supreme Court ruling and issues uh, related to... LGBT, et cetera, in general. But, but I want to remind us that this is not, that's not what this is about. This is about life as followers of Jesus in general. As we're, as we're walking in following Jesus, we are constantly you know, welcoming sinners. We are constantly bewaring of hypocrisy. Um, and we're constantly aiming for the mark and calling each other to aim for the mark. Um, so... Let's be people who shoot for the mark. Um, let's be people who trust in God's grace for all of our failings. Let's make sure that we see others, not just ourselves, in light of that grace. Um, and when we fall, let's be people who get back up again. You know, sometimes we're going to fall flat on our face. And when we do fall flat on our face, we get up the next day and we say, today, I'm aiming on target. Today, I'm shooting for the mark. Um, Every time we fail, we get up again, and, and we shoot for the mark. And so I want to just end by praying for us that this would, be, this would be a safe place for all people, and also that we would grow together in discipleship, that we'd be people who have grace for one another, and that we would aim for the mark. And so if you can stand with me, I'd like to just pray over us.
Lord, I just want to take a, a moment to acknowledge first that we're not capable of doing this on our own and our own strength. I just want to confess that left to my own devices, the bent of my heart is to, uh, to go my own way and do my own thing. Um, to have a heart of judgment toward other people around me. And God, you, you've given us forgiveness. You've given us grace. You've called us to be people of grace, and you've showed us where the target is. You've showed us how you want us to live. And God, would you, would you empower us as a community to be, to be focused on you, uh, to be people who continually aim for the mark, to be people who get up when we fall and aim again for the mark. God, would you be with us? Would you fill us with your love and fill us with your grace? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. As we usually do, we're going to end with a song of worship and an opportunity to receive prayer. So let's worship the Lord together. I just want to invite the prayer ministry team to come on up to the front. Every week at Coast, as we end our services, we have an opportunity to come up and to receive prayer. It's an important part of our community to us is that we we come before the Lord with our, our problems and our struggles uh, together. And we believe that God meets us there and that he brings healing and transformation into our lives. And so I just want to encourage anyone who would like to be prayed for to come on up to the front at the, as we end the service. We would love to have a chance to pray with you. And then I'm going to bless us as we head out to enjoy the afternoon of our holiday weekend. Um, Holy Spirit, uh, just thank you once again for this community. Thank you for, for the love that's here. God, would you bless us to love one another well? Uh, would you bless us to walk in faithfulness and forgiveness and in grace? Uh, would you go with us from here as we go out and help us to reflect your love in the world? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you guys. Have a wonderful last afternoon of your weekend, and we'll see you back next week.